Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and its historical group. And welcome to this evening's latest in a series of collection talks. It's my pleasure to hand over to Gilly Reid, Chair of the Royal Photographic Society's historical group, who will in introduce our speaker this evening. So Gilly, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, tonight, our guest is from Liverpool, Ang Leave. Curator of Photographic Collections, Archives Centre, Maritime Museum, National Museums of Liverpool. Um, Anne has a BA Honours degree in Special Philosophy from the University of Hull, a Foundation Qualification in Art and Design from Liverpool Polytechnic and an MA in the History of Art and Design from the University of Central England. So a very broad spectrum. Anne worked part-time for the Walker Art Gallery Liverpool as a slide librarian in 1992 to 94 and cataloguing assistant from 92 to 2002 also cataloguing assistant part-time at the art collections department at the university of liverpool 94 to 97. during this time she was also gaining experience as a part-time archivist at the chambray hardman house the chambray, chambray hardman trust in liverpool that was between 1995 and 2002. This was before the National Trust took over ownership of the house, which is opened by the Trust now. In 1999, as part of the Sharing Museum Skills Millennium Awards, she undertook a six week secondment to the then National Museum of Photography, Film and Television in Bradford, cataloguing and sorting a section of their carte de visite collection. I've never thought of them doing that before, but there we are. She then became curator of photographic archives, maritime archives and library, Merseyside Maritime Museum, National Museums of Liverpool from 2002 to 2014. And from 2014 to the present, she has been the curator of photographic collections at the Archives Centre, Maritime Museum, National Museums, Liverpool where she manages the maritime photographic collections as part of the latter two posts, which also includes collections with a broader content, such as the Stuart Bale collection, which she's going to talk about tonight. She gives gallery talks and lectures, as well as themed online Bale exhibitions, and has arranged and co-curated and curated Bale exhibitions within the National Museum of Liverpool. Other co-curating includes Come Dancing, at the Museum of Liverpool Life, 2003 to 4, Metropolis, capturing modern Liverpool at the National Conservation Centre in 2008, and curating, celebrating the Stuart Bale Photographic Collection, a nine screens presentation in the foyer of the Museum of Liverpool, 2019. So now I shall hand over to you, who will be much more interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Right, well, thank you, uh, Gilly, for that introduction. Um, and uh, hello to everybody who's uh, come along this evening. Um, I hope you enjoy seeing some of the Stuart Bale photographs. Um, I assume that uh, most, if not all of you, have heard either of the Stuart Bale collection or uh, the, uh, the firm of Stuart Bale Limited. And uh, this evening, I'm going to give uh, an introduction to the collection. So, I don't know really what your level of knowledge is, but um, this introduction will um, include uh, a brief uh, uh, history of the, the firm and how it came into being and how it uh, ended. Um, it will cover um, the collection that we hold, the, um, the legacy of the, um, the you know, the, ba the Bale Archive and also um, a cross-section of the, uh, um, a very small cross-section of the images in the collection, as well as what we have done with the collection uh, to date in terms of uh, conservation and cataloging and um, how we've improved accessibility and uh, what our hopes and plans are for the collection in the future. So, um, to move to the first slide. So 
what um, what is uh, Stuart Bale or who was he and um, what was you know what was what was the um, the firm? So the Stuart Bale, um, the firm of Stuart Bale Limited, uh, was a commercial photographic um, firm based in Liverpool, uh, largely during the nineteenth century. Sorry, largely during the twentieth century, and um, uh, they also had a. Um, a a base in London uh, from about 1949 to 1970. The uh, photograph that you have in front of you is Edward Stuart Bale, and he was really the driving force behind the uh, the photographic company and, and developing it. He was um, the, uh, the the firm uh, the firm's origins began with his father, who was Herbert Stuart Bale, and he was an advertising and printing agent uh, who emigrated from Australia in the late nineteenth century to the UK and settled in um, in and around Liverpool and based his business there. So he came with his family and his three sons, and that included uh, this gentleman here, Edward Stuart Bale. He was one of his sons. As his business progressed, he found that he couldn't um, commission the quality of images that he, he needed. So already there was this um, drive for excellence uh, within the firm. And his solution to this was to uh, bring in one of his sons to the firm, Edward Stuart Bale, and to train uh, or, or to ensure that he was trained uh, as a photographer. So clearly, uh, we can see uh, by Edward's name that he was, he did become a photographer. He was a, a fellow of the Institute of British Photographers and a fellow of the Royal Photographic Society. Um, and uh, the, the firm sort of gradually uh, started to offer photography uh, and, and began to morph uh, slowly into a photographic practice. If you look at uh, street directories, Liverpool street directories, Gores and Kellys, and you look under the name of Stuart Bale, uh, around the early part of the uh, 20th century, say around 1911, you will find a number of entries. So you will find the name under advertising agents, you'll find it under photographers and also under printers. The firm actually started in, the first mention is in about 1899. Um, and. Uh, as I said, gradually it changes into uh, uh, an exclusive photographic practice. Uh, I think part of this was the success of, of uh, Bale as a photographer and the fact that he, he met uh, the demands of his commissions and that people were happy um, with his work. Um, but also to some extent, possibly it was because his father who was born in uh, 1859 was now getting older and was gradually withdrawing from the business. So um, Stuart Bale was, Edward Stuart Bale was um, the driving force behind the, the company. He expanded it into a very uh, successful uh, photographic business, um, which drove off a, a lot of a competition and because of the standards they uh, could command important uh, commissions uh, from a, if you think about Liverpool at that time, from a, um, a still very much a thriving uh, city um, with lots of, uh, you know, shipping and engineering projects and, and architectural projects. Bale describes himself as an architectural um, industrial and shipping photographer, and basically that's where the concentration um, of his uh, his work lies. Um, so the firm uh, continued uh, from from strength to strength. 
Um, but very sadly, uh, Edward Stuart Bale uh, died uh, at a rather early age of 55 in 1944. And as you can see from the screen, um, he, one of the obituaries uh, from the British Journal of Photography, uh, uh, give uh, quite a eulogy to him and, and indicate that uh, the, the words that they've used here are, his photographs have been exhibited all over the world and no industrial photographer was better known or more highly respected. Um, so clearly the uh, firm was extremely well regarded. So what happened to it after, um, after Stuart Bale's death? Bale was um, a very congenial person and he, uh, by all accounts, and he, uh, um, he looked after his um, and cultivated his clients and um, increased in, increased his business opportunities. So this is a um, a compliment slip. Uh, we have a, a certain amount of ephemera in the collection uh, from the company, and I would date this to uh, the, around 1944. Um, as you can see, Edward Stuart Bale. And the bottom right hand corner there, his name has been struck through. So this must presumably be post his death. Uh, you can see the, uh, the Bale logo there in pale green in the, in the top in the center. And um, as a company, Bale was always concerned with their, with their kind of branding, with their typeface and um, uh, with their letterheads, and they constantly updated these, even, even to the extent of updating the, the style of their wet stamps and the, um, the, uh, the, the, the printing of the firm's uh, name on their glassine bags. So if you go down this list, uh, you note that uh, the next name is a, a Annie Hilda Bale, who was Edward's wife. She was a director and chairman, and I'm not sure, uh, I don't believe that she was a photographer, and she, but she was, uh, she ran the firm um, for about six years after uh, Edward Stuart Bale's death until 1951, uh, when she, uh, she died. Um, and then the firm was run uh, by uh, the uh, daughter, Hilda Margaret Bale and Kenneth Williams, who continued with the firm um, until about 1982. So if you look at the registers later on in the, sort of in the late 70s, early 80s, you know that the orders are falling off considerably. So the firm was clearly in some sort of trouble. Now, this hasn't really been researched in any detail. It could be um, it could be a number of reasons, really. Um, it could be the the competition. It could be uh, to do with personalities with within the firm. It could be to do with the fact that they were losing clients. So some of the photographers within the firm of Stuart Bale after Edward's death, um, had, well, reputedly had asked for a pay rise, but it. Um, it wasn't forthcoming, and three of them left and formed their own firm of Elson, Mann and Cooper, which was a fairly well-known and well-regarded firm itself, because they took the bail values with them. Um, so they would have also taken some significant clients, so there's a certain element of client loss as well. Um, so it's difficult to say, and obviously requires more research, but the firm sadly ended in uh, 1982, uh, on the very early part of 1982. So if you think about that, there was uh, you know, somewhere in the region of 80 years when they were um, offering um, photography and, and clearly that produced a, a, large, a large body of work. So what does the what does the collection consist of? What have we got? So we have, um, I would describe, uh, the vast majority of the output of the firm of Stuart Bale Limited. And um, 
that consists of approximately 200,000 negatives. And these negatives are um, in different formats, but largely they divide be roughly between one third glass and two thirds film. So the glass negatives, for the most part, there are smaller formats, but for the most part, um, they date from the, the start of the film to, uh, to around 1948. And there was a crossover period where introducing film. So film uh, glass continues to about 1955 and sometimes beyond that date. They were large format, as you can see, 12 by 10. Um, which is approximately 30 by uh, 25 centimetres. Um, the issue with glass, of course, is they're fragile. Um, and if they are not stored in the right conditions, they can, um, they can become damp and mouldy. And if they become mouldy, uh, the, the, um, the image forming layer, the gelatin, is eaten, so you're losing the image. Um, some of the negatives that came to the collection because prior to them arriving, they were stored in a basement, which didn't have ideal conditions and had been flooded, uh, were damaged. So we've got some water damage negatives of a small proportion. Some of them are cracked or broken or chipped, but still obviously worth, um, worth retaining because they you can still see the um, you can still see the images. Um, the other thing I should say is most of the negatives that we have in the collection, they don't date from the early part of the 20th century, but from around 1924. We have some earlier negatives, but um, uh, for, for the most part, um, we've, we've lost all those early years pre-First World War. Um, during the First World War on post that time, uh, which is a great shame. So the other part of the collection, the two thirds, which are, totals around 133,000 images, are film negatives. And the film negatives um, are in two, uh, uh, they, they're in two, you have two different types of supports. So you have this acetate, cellulose acetate, cellulose diacetate, and also polyester. So the acetate dates from the crossover period from when Bale was uh, using less uh, glass plates. And so that's about uh, 1948, they begin to be introduced to around 1960 when the um, polyester, which is a much more stable form of uh, support was, um, was introduced. As you can see, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you know that um, acetate has, a, has problems with deterioration if they're not kept in the right sort of conditions. And unfortunately, the collection hadn't been uh, particularly well stored. So if the um, negative is in a, in a humid environment, um, they begin to deteriorate and the uh, acetic acid, which is part of their chemical makeup, begins to become, is, is released and starts an autocatalytic process. So it can't be stopped, but it can be slowed down. And this means that the image layers start to separate. And um, th this is quite typical of what happens. They have this sort of channeling where the, the layers are lifting from the support. Um, just to give you an idea of the quantities that we have of damaged negatives, we have about 5,000, we've classified them as good, bad and ugly, and we have about 5,000 in this condition, about 12,000 that are bad, and the bad really just have some sort of channeling around the perimeter, and then um, we have about over 100,000 good, and they include the polyester. But one thing I would say about these images um, is when, if you put them on a light box, you can actually see an image, uh, unlike the glass, where if there's damage, you, you actually lose the image. Um, they become difficult to, um, 
they become difficult to photograph because they can become three dimensional. But there is um, uh, there is e equipment um, out there that has the ability to focus stack, um, so they can uh, photograph uh, items which are are not perfectly flat. So in terms of uh, the other aspect of the collection, and this is a very important aspect, it's the documentation. So uh, without the documentation, um, the, the, it would be very difficult to, to, to know what we had. And um, we have two very good sets of documentation in Bale. They did, they, they did keep good records. Uh, and this is an example of one of those forms of do documentation, which is which are the negative registers, sorry, um, which are the client registers. So there's two forms. We have negative registers, which are indexed on negative number and therefore date. They date from 1913 to, uh, to the early 80s when the, the firm folded. Um, and the client registers, probably date a little bit later from that, um, from about the, the early 1920s um, towards the end of the firm. And there's about there's 24 client registers for Liverpool, two for London. Um, and the client registers have um, slightly more information in them. So they have the full postal address of the client, and uh, they have the number of exposures, which you can see in the penultimate field, in, in the penultimate field there. And they sometimes have notes on um, the format as well. Um, so um, this means that uh, we, can, we, we know they, they provide a basic uh, um, subject index to what we have, and they, they date items and um, they provide a client, um, a client's name. So onto the images. So we'll go through a cross section of images. So as I was saying before, uh, we, we don't have much in the way of early images. And uh, sometimes um, uh, we receive offers and, and we make purchases. And we receive this amazing and generous offer um, from a member of the public of four uh, Bale photographic prints of the construction of the Cunard building. So Bale clearly covered this uh, as progress photography, which he did a lot of. He did a lot of architecture and because of his status, it was a lot of significant architecture, uh, both in Liverpool, the Northwest, and also um, ar um, around the, further around the country. Um, so this image uh, dates to 1913, when the, uh, the uh, um, excavations for the foundations were being made for the Cunard building, and uh, is the earliest image in our collection. And this is a way that we can fill the gap of, of those missing earlier images. Um, we have a, a certain number of prints already. We had about 4,000, but obviously the prints were the end product and they were the things that were given, um, that were, were sold obviously to them, supplied to the clients. So um, we'll quickly show you the, uh, the rest of the images. So there's, we only have four, but they show it in, in significant stages of construction. And here we, um, we see, um, the Cunard building, which sits between the Liver building on the right and the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board building, as it was then, on the left. Um, one of the three uh, uh, iconic buildings uh, along the Liverpool waterfront. And here is uh, the, the, the structure has reached, uh, reached about the, the, second, um, the second floor. This is the third image, and uh, it's, 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 it's nearing completion here in 1915. And what's interesting about this image is, uh, as in so many photographs, you get peripheral information. Now, the peripheral information is not noted in the uh, original documentation, but it is, it would be noted in any um, digitization project where we would do extended um, uh, 
uh, extended uh, catalogue descriptions. Um, um, and here you can see on the hoardings um, that there are some um, advertisements. And if we move to the next slide, we can see a detail uh, from this. And it shows that because this building, this is a reminder that this building was being built during the uh, First World War, these are recruitment posters um, for uh, people to join up um, as, as um, to uh, as soldiers during the during the First World War. Uh, and we move on to the final uh, image in this in this series, um, and this one shows the uh, Cunard building completed. And it's nice to have uh, people included in this because it uh, gives a sense of the time, 1916, when the, the building was completed. As I said, architecture was a, um, um, a, a, a strong element of the type of work that Bale undertook. Um, this is, uh, he worked on both of the, uh, of the, cathedrals in Liverpool, so the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral, this, this one is, and also the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral. Um, and this one shows the uh, crypt by Edwin Lutyens, and this was for the grand design they had for their, that cathedral, which was um, pre-Second World War, uh, and which didn't have really enough funding to continue post-Second World War. Um, and that's when the, the later, more modern Gibbard design came in, but the crypt was actually completed. And this shows a photograph of that. But one of the reasons I've shown this is because it has um, crop marks on. And if you think um, uh, about Bale's uh, uh, the company style, um, it seemed to me that a lot of their work was uh, carefully uh, thought out and um, prefigured. And you don't often come across crop marks in the collection. There, there are a small quantity. It's not clear why. Um, it could be that on some sites, um, it was more difficult to photograph. But anyway, the crop marks are there. And if we move to the next image, you see this, this is a much uh, tighter image, just featuring this, um, this amazing, uh, structure, the, the, the vaulting of the, um, of the crypt. So uh, as you can see that um, Bale uh, produced uh, an amazing record of both the built and commercial environment, particularly of Liverpool and the Northwest, but they did receive national um, commissions from across the country. They all took um, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of architecture, as I said, and there's a nice uh, strand within the collection of cinemas, uh, especially cinemas during their heyday, um, cinemas both in Liverpool and and around the northwest. And this is um, uh, a cinema in Liverpool, a very large cinema, and it's uh, it's very much in keeping with the '30s modern '30s style, and. Uh, Obviously here they want to highlight the cinema at night, which has this neon styling. Um, so it's very much taken at the, the time when cinemas were these, these kind of grand um, picture palaces. And of course you get the incidental information and on here you can see, you can see the, uh, the billing, uh, which is a film called Wonder Bar with uh, Dick Powell and uh, Dolores Del Rio. And this is another example. This is a, an internal view of a, a cinema in, um, uh, in, in Wavertree in Liverpool. This was the Abbey Cinema. A lot of cinemas have since uh, has been demolished. This one still exists, uh, although not as a cinema. But um, this shows these uh, amazing lighting uh, features. And um, even though it's black and white, and pretty much most of Bale's photographs were black and white. Uh, it still conveys the, um, the opulence of, of uh, these, um, these interiors. So um, moving on to some other architecture, these, this building was, uh, is, is uh, near the pier head. 
uh, and it's the one of the ventilation uh, buildings, uh, there were six, which uh, regulated the airflow in the uh, Queensway Mersey Tunnel, which was a major construction from 1925 to, uh, sorry, nine, 1925 to 1934 of the first um, underwater roadway from Liverpool to uh, Birkenhead. So this was a major uh, commission. There was uh, this this particular this one was designed by Herbert Rouse, a, a significant architect who designed quite a number of buildings in Liverpool uh, in the modern um, Art Deco style. And um, I, I think this uh, you know what what's interesting about this image is it's uh, it's it's a very dynamic, well thought through image as most of his images are. Uh, it has this um, uh, um, this diagonal line, which is the uh, uh, Liverpool overhead work, railway cutting through it, and then you've got the uh, the thrusting tower, and then sort of anchored by these two cars at the bottom. But what what is uh, particularly interesting about this is the the nature of the um, the veil collection because the the collection the body of work itself has a value um its entirety has a value over and above the individual photographs um, and that value is that it represents a large body of work 200,000 negatives and a, a significant date span of somewhere in the region of at least 60 years and this allows uh, on a, a variety of strands, um, comparative uh, analysis. Um, so for instance, you could look at this building and again, you can see um, this was the, the year before another photograph of it. And obviously the, you could look at the different ways it was photographed and how that related to the commission. Um, but also um, if you, look at um, these buildings as they were photographed over years you can see the way um, you know some buildings disappear and um, other buildings um, pop up so you can um, you can look at this way and you the, the, you can look at the collection in this way and it can be used as um, a significant research tool. As I mentioned uh, Bale secured the very prestigious uh, commission to photograph the progress of the construction of the uh, Liverpool Queensway uh, Mersey Tunnel. This was a major engineering project of its time and um, it was, uh, um, as I've put here, the largest subaqueous tunnel built. Um, and Bale's agenda here, and he produced somewhere in the region of a thousand negatives, was to both record the progress and the processes. I mean, here you can see uh, a weapon in the foreground who's using a spanner to tighten the cast iron um, sections, which reinforced the, um, the structure. Um, and you can see the suspended roadway above, so you can see how the work was carried out, the suspended roadway was there to remove spoil and to bring in materials. But there was, he also included more than that because his, it, his photographs very often have these strong pictorial elements because he's, he's basically trying to um, uh, align this with the, uh, the magnificence of the of the feat here of the engineering feat and um if if it's sort of aggrandize it um because this is part of the reason he's making the record and he does this also by using scale so by including people and you can see two people here you can see the curve of the tunnel and this has been very carefully thought out and placed so you can see a further smaller figure who's there placed um, in the, in the centre of the tunnel, in the centre of the curve, just at the point where the, um, the tones change. So he's just at the point 
uh, near the lighter section, which, which highlights him. And you can see that this four small figure obviously emphasizes the, um, the size of this project and the, uh, the um, engineering, uh, amazing engineering uh, achievement that it was. Um, other photographs of the tunnel include those that focus on processes. So here, these uh, cast iron sections were being sealed with um, uh, lead, um, lead wire, uh, and then they were infilled with uh, concrete and sealed uh, with layers of paint. But you can see the working conditions here. Uh, obviously, you can see a certain amount of water and, and also the so sort of minimal health and safety um, conditions that there were around at that time. So this moves on to uh, another print. Uh, this is something that we acquired. This is an album. It's always nice to have an album because an album shows what the end product was. And this is what was supplied to, um, the, uh, to the client. And this was um, part of a series of celebrations uh, to, to mark the opening of the tunnel on the 18th of July 1934. And to emphasize its significance, it's opened by the King and Queen, so King George V, Queen Mary, and you can see them there under this um, uh, canopy on the right-hand side, and they had a, a drive-through. They even had curtains on the tunnel, which uh, they didn't draw back, but they went up at a 45 degree angle. And there's masses of people here because they came out to celebrate this event, which was also an expression of confidence between the two cities, between Birkenhead and Liverpool, joining to uh, to make the flow of to improve the flow of traffic and to improve uh, trade, and also from the hinterlands on both sides. So it was certainly an expression of confidence going forward for Liverpool's future. Um, and you can see that people, you know, have taken their life in their hands and they're sitting on top of, um, on the top of roofs and the uh, near side buildings. Um, so, um, additionally, um, Bale also took these industrial photographs. And um, uh, if you think back to the documentation, and actually I should have pointed this out, on that page, there was an entry for this photograph. Um, and uh, this was a, uh, um, a power station um, and in Clarence Dock. Uh, so this was just slightly north of the, uh, of the pier head. And um, it's uh, a very sort of architectural photograph. And um, it's got uh, strong, uh, you know, strong diagonal elements. It has um, a perspective in it. It has an aisle. Again, it's got people for um, uh, you know to 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 give it in the idea of its size. It's almost cathedral-like, and it's very balanced. Uh, and it's a very considered um, photograph. You can see uh, by these two ladders in the front. There's a a nameplate, and this is Babcock and Wilcox, who were the company who um, produced these uh, boilers and had them fitted and obviously wanted this photograph taken. And these hoppers here, crushed coal was put into them to, uh, to generate power. Um, obviously, Bale, or the, the company, uh, thought this, this was a, um, a good photograph because they submitted it, as they did a number of their photographs, um, both to the, um, this one was to the Institute of British Photographers a year after it was taken, but also to the Royal Photographic Society. So they did exhibit um, as, as the obituary um, indicated. Um, Bale also, in terms of, in terms of uh, factory interiors, um, he did take quite a lot of factory interiors and this provides a kind of social history of, um, of working conditions within within factories over a you know quite a, a long date span. So um, here we have um, an important company, uh, BICC, British Insulated Calendars Cables, who produced uh, cables, as you can see in this in this large room. Um, and um, BICC was the only client who had a dedicated client register 
So they had that much work from them, they have their own client register. You can see what the working conditions are like here, you can see the processes, um, and uh, they form a, a, an important part of, uh, of um, sort of history of industry. We've got um, interiors of uh, Meccano and uh, Dunlop and Fords and Laundries. So, for example, so um, also Bale took a lot of, uh, he was involved in commerce and, um, and uh, was commissioned by commercial clients and that included uh, shop owners and they wanted photographs of their window displays on the, the interiors of their shops. And um, this uh, uh, image is a, it's a fairly early one, it's of Woolworths. Uh, they had a, um, a, a, I think a promotion house all week and they have this hardware um, with tools in the window. So what's interesting about this, and this comes with this concept of this being a, um, an entity over and above the individual photograph for research, um, without wanting to, um, Kind of make snap judgments. Uh, you can see that there's different the the way that the uh, shop windows are displayed that changes over the years. I mean that in some ways it might be a bit of a simplistic statement, but you'd have to look at quite a few of them. But you can see here it's very much like a visual in inventory. So if you walk past this shop and you thought you wanted something, if you could see it in the window you knew they would have it. Whereas sort of nearly 20 years later, you have another shop. Um, this is a department store, a sort of um, uh, a fairly um, uh, sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't know, it's fairly elite store, if you like, or market. And they have a window display, which is um, a bit more oblique. Uh, it, it's more of a concept uh, that they're trying to sell an idea and what uh, they haven't crammed the window, although they haven't made a very careful display, but what, what they're trying to show here um, is this idea of these, uh, this display of stockings, that they are quality, um, that they're flattering. So you've got a pair of legs coming out of a, out of a frame there. Um, that they are um, luxury and soft, and you've got these two kind of rather strange wings in the in the center of the image, where the the the, uh, the stockings are, are obviously you know kind of flying. Uh, so you can you can uh, research elements within the collection on this basis. Obviously, if the collection is digitized, this is a much um, much easier thing to do. So uh, they also took street scenes. Um, sometimes this was incidental. Um, this one was commissioned by the, um, uh, the uh, Liverpool Chamber of Commerce and the building on the left-hand side, nearest, um, near to on the left-hand side is the um, fruit exchange. And you can see that there's lots of vehicles um, to do with the commerce of Liverpool and obviously Liverpool being a port. Directly in front of you, you can see um, some of the flatbed wagons. This one has had, had bananas. Um, they're double parked, it's very busy. And we know actually that this photograph was taken at 1.25, so it's obviously taken during a, a busy lunch hour. Um, so, and you can see vehicles and incidental information. So these vehicles, uh, they are also photographed vehicles almost as portraits. So a lot of firms were introducing fleets uh, or, or they had, you know, a, bought, bought a van and they had it branded and they wanted to celebrate that. So most of Bale's work is about celebration, it's about uh, memorialising something and keeping a record of something positive and something innovative and what was, was, was kind of new and um, cutting edge at the time. Um, they took uh, photographs of social events, such as this uh, dinner dance at Riverside Restaurant. Again, this gives, um, uh, there's a, a strong strand of costume, uh, both costume from displays in shop windows and um, in shop interiors, 
but also the you know the costume that people are wearing and um, um, uh, you know obviously uh, internal um, design as well. So perhaps one of the uh, the more negative elements that they all photographed was uh, was uh, bomb damage during the Second World War. Um, and he undertook quite a lot of that, especially around the, the dock areas and Bootle. Um, but this one was taken in the city centre, and this is quite a well-known image. This is one of Bale's panoramas, and he, uh, he um, produced a few. There were six uh, plates, uh, six large format plates, which from this image, and but um, this one, they only used three. And I think, if you look about a third from the left, you can see a vague white vertical line, and that is where the first uh, plate ends. And it shows the, exactly what it's uh, intended to, the, the, um, the complete devastation of bomb damage during the Second World War in 1941. You can see the uh, um, Customs, the Liverpool Customs House uh, straight ahead at the end of uh, South Cask Street there, the neoclassical building, and just vaguely on the, on the skyline uh, in the first third on the left, you can see the Liverpool Anglican Cathedral, uh, which is still in the process of being built. Um, another uh, panorama that, uh, this is a two-plate panorama that they produce. This is a 1613 image. 1613 with a prefix, a negative number prefix, of images that were non-commissioned as far as we know. Um, photographers were asked to, when they were out and about, to uh, take uh, photo opportunities, um, which they did, um, although this looks like a, a fairly deliberate photograph. Um, and presumably these photographs, you know, were potentially offered to clients uh, further along, um, uh, um, the, uh, and um, they uh, also, some of them will have um, a, a standard negative number as well, which seemed to me to indicate that they were um, uh, acquired by a client. Um, this one shows the Liverpool waterfront, of which Bale took a lot of photographs. Obviously, the waterfront is very significant to Liverpool, the buildings and the, you know, the commerce, the shipping, etc. Um, and we can see the three graces in the centre and the Albert Dock and the cathedral over the right to the right. And the three um, chimneys on the left is Clarence Dock Power Station. What makes this image is the sky, and uh, again, this is quite a pictorial image, and it almost looks as if somebody's sort of thrown a pot of white paint, and it is a very, um, very arresting and um, impressive uh, image. Um, Bale did a lot of shipping photography. He did uh, uh, covered shipbuilding progress, ship fit outs once the ship was launched, launches uh, speed trials for some of the um, major. Um, shipbuilding companies and major shipping companies. So that was also in Liverpool, but all around the country, including John Brown's shipyards uh, for Queen Mary I and uh, Queen Elizabeth. Um, this is the uh, Empress of Britain, and uh, he covered the construction of this uh, vessel. And it's uh, interesting because this is quite an abstract view. Um, it's um, it's uh, it's really a concentration of uh, you know shapes and tones, and uh, is 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 quite a is quite an unusual um, is quite an unusual image for him in some ways. Um, here, this is a very more of a standard view of a ship uh, being launched. This is Mauritania II, which was uh, built at Camelot. Cam um, a big event. Uh, the ship was launched before. Um, anything was really placed in sight, in. so it has no funnels or engine or anything of that sort. Um, but these were big events, as you can see, there's thousands of people here, um, and they were, um, they were covered, um, you know, by the, by the local press. Um, and uh, bail photographers would cover them. Obviously, they had a, a, just one chance to cover a shipping, a ship launch. And uh, very often their aim would be to uh, get an album back to the client, uh, either the shipping company or the, um, uh, the shipbuilding company by the end of 
the day. So quite a lot of pressure. Um, so uh, again, here the ship is uh, launched and you can see it's now in, in the Mersey ready to go to the fitting out basin. But what I would draw your attention to is this, um, this crane on the left hand side. So um, you can get further layers of information. This is a detail from the, the, the previous uh, photograph. Um, you can get further layers of information from Bale. It's almost like there's another set of images um, by enlarging them, uh, seeing things that you wouldn't normally see. And this is a case in point. So here we have photographers who were covering the, the launch and we see two different types of photographers. And obviously one is, is um, uh, um, a movie photographer and um, you know, he's obviously moving himself to, to capture the film and a stills photographer like a bail photographer who is, uh, uh, is slightly above him. Um, and this is a camera here. We don't know that much about what sort of cameras Bale used, but he, he used large format cameras, Bellows cameras, um, which were um, a combination of um, uh, uh, mahogany and um, uh, uh, brass and um, very, very basic, very manual. They used combination lenses. So they had about four lenses and uh, they could produce uh, uh, lenses of nine inches to 19 inches. Um, I believe they had Thornton Pickard cameras at one point, but also I've been told that the photographers themselves um, would rebuild cameras. They did get, have accidents with them sometimes and they, they, they were, were able to rebuild them. And you can also see the, the very, what would have been the very heavy bag here of a photographer of his glass slides um, to, to the right of the tri tripod. Um, photographers, bail photographers, and I, I don't know whether this was a bail photographer, it would have required two, and whether two were used on an event like this, I don't know, but very often they would take a, an apprentice who would uh, assist them. Um, so we'll come to the last of the bale images, and here we have um, uh, going to talk very briefly um, about um, the collection and what we've done with it. So this is how the collection came to us in these strawboard boxes with these negative number separations on the side. And um, these boxes were falling apart. They weren't really adequate for uh, storing. The, the negatives, the acidic. So uh, the initial aim was to uh, rehouse the collection. So it's a very big collection and takes time to rehouse. As part of the rehousing progress, process, they were um, cleaned. And by that, I mean, they would set with the glass, they were dusted. And um, on the non-emulsion side, they would have been swapped with deionized water. So, so they're, they're in a good condition and um, you know, they can be photographed. So um, this is now what the storage looks like. So the storage for the film negatives and the glass negatives is different. So this is the one third of the film negatives. Uh, they're stored uh, in drawers like this. They're stored in a particular pattern um, because they're very heavy and they're in individual full flap enclosures. And we had a, um, uh, work was from when the collection came in, in, into, uh, in, into the museum in 1986. And from that time, uh, conservation was undertaken. Um, and then there was a bit of a gap from 2002 when a member of staff left. But um, someone in our conservation department um, uh, organized in the, around 2011, um, a big um, uh, volunteer project to uh, complete all the cleaning of the glass negatives. And that's pretty much what, what has been done. So that's working with a lot of volunteers for whom we are um, you know, always grateful for their help because this couldn't have been done without them. 
Um, we also have drawers like this um, as part of the project. We, we didn't have any full, full flap enclosures. They do tend to be very expensive. So they were, they were um, put in these drawers in, in boxes. Uh, in addition to that, we have storage of the uh, film negatives. So as I said, there's an issue with the longevity of these negatives. And um, because the uh, storage history uh, was to some extent unknown, but not particularly good before they came to us, uh, they were frozen in around uh, 2003. And um, so they were thrown in their category. So we'd have all the good and all the bad together, and all the ugly together. And they are um, kept at minus nine degrees uh, centigrade in this freezer unit. Um, and this arrests uh, their deterioration until such time as they can be um, as they can be uh, digitized. Um, and uh, I should also say that in terms of the documentation, we've done a lot of work. There's lots of people working on this, not just me. And um, so we've had a lot of volunteer help and we've imported all the Liverpool client registers, which is, gives us an instant basic subject index to an access database. And we've got most of the two London registers, um, which have been inputted as well. So that's progressed a lot. And we also have um, location index for most of the, uh, for the work. Um, and we're catching up with a backlog of that. And a lot of that has been done by other members, by volunteers, and also other members of staff with our, within our um, department. So I, I'd like to finish here with a little bit more um, of um, uh, Bale's uh, obituary in the British General of Photography, because I think that um, this uh, can't really be put better. So um, I think he very much succeeded in what he set out to do, and, and that is true of you know, that is true of the firm and the, the body of the work that we have. Um, so I'll just read this out. So his name is associated with a quality of performance which has never been equaled in the field of photography in which he specialized. Superb craftsmanship allied to a profound pictorial sense produced an endless flow of magnificent pictures, which expressed the majesty of great ships, the power of heavy industry, or the grandeur of modern architecture with an erring judgment. Moreover, he possessed a skill, a still real, rarer quality of leadership, which stimulated in those who worked with him, the same insistence upon faultless technique coupled with pictorial insight, thus his work will indeed live on. Um, and so we have this um, amazing collection, but as you've seen, and will have concluded from the storage, um, it is not very accessible because it is a negative collection. So um, we're working on the documentation and the storage to make sure it's in a good position for when we can digitize it. We have had in the past, we did make some effort to do this. Um, we've um, made, uh, uh, we have submitted bids, but unfortunately were not successful um, with the Arts and Humanities Research Council and with the Leave Hume Trust. Uh, but very often that depends upon who else is bidding sort of at, at the time. Um, but um, we have a certain number of these images that are already digitized and, and, and they're the ones that we supply uh, generally when people contact us, because uh, as you can see, um, it is it was a very time consuming to actually search for items and, um, and bring them out. And obviously those items that are in the freezer uh, would need acclimatization, they need to be defrosted, et cetera. But it is something that uh, is our aim to, um, to digitize, uh, and then it will may, be made uh, fully available to the, to, well, to, the, to the world, really, um, through technology. So um, just at the end here, I'll say thank you for, uh, for coming along and for listening. And um, 
I've put some details here. I've put a link uh, which takes you to further information about bail, and that in turn will take you to um, to the uh, uh, information sheet, uh, which tells you uh, quite a bit that I uh, of information that I've already told you. Um, it has my contact details on it. It also has the um, the contact details for the department. And I would say if you did want to make contact and it's after next Monday, the 14th of February, you should use the uh, the general email address because I'm actually um, retiring on that Monday. Um, so I will say uh, thank you again for listening and I hope you've enjoyed seeing the images. And um, I believe some people may have some questions. Well, that was wonderful, Anne. Thank you so much for, for sharing the, the collection with us and for showing us some of the, the highlights. We, we have a, a number of questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to just pick up the ones in the chat first and then a couple have come directly to me. Um, so there's a uh, first question we had in uh, said, uh, I manage the Queensway Mersey Tunnel Tours and look after the archive. We have 380 physical bail prints of the construction of Queensway and just mm -hmm. over 300 of Kingsway. I think some may possibly have gone missing over the years. So do you know how many Queensway construction images were taken and what would be the best way to store our images at the moment as they're just loose? Uh, right. Well, I would, um, in terms of the Queensway, we have roughly, well, there was a commission for approximately a thousand. Uh, so we would have to have to check how many we have. So we also have some prints, um, and um, uh, and we all you know, we have negatives as well, um, and we also have uh, um, uh, you know the documentation. Um, so uh, off the top of my head, it's a bit difficult to say exactly how many in the collection. But it did, as, as far as I'm aware, it did generate um, a commission for around a thousand images. And we also have the album of the opening of the tunnel. So um, uh, if you have prints, um, there's a number of ways of keep, uh, keeping, uh, keeping them. And you, you would need to uh, contact a, a, a conservation supplier for uh, supplies. So um, we keep our prints in a sort of clamshell uh, uh, conservation quality, um, acid-free, uh, lignin-free boxes. And within those, we'll have them in polyester sleeves. Um, and obviously that is, a, that is a safe way of storing them, but obviously you have to have them in the right environmental conditions. Um, and so it depends on whether you're able to, you, you know, control the environment. Um, uh, the important thing about environment is you want to avoid spikes in that, and it's always good to, to monitor. Um, and you would you'd be looking at um, you'd be looking at humidity levels of uh, I don't know around forty you know forty percent or maybe a little bit more could tolerate, um, and uh, uh, temperatures around sixteen or eighteen um, degrees C. Um, but there's lots of products, um, you, you may want to have them to place them in uh, polyester sleeves in, in, um, in albums and um, uh, conservation companies also sell albums as well, um, because you may, it, uh, they can be easier to look at, so it depends what your, you know, what your end product is, whether you're, um, you know, you're showing them to people or whether you're just storing them, um, I suppose the ideal again is to, is to photograph them. Thank you, Anne. Um, we've got a comment from Liz who said that uh, the picture you showed of the photographers in detail, it's interesting that there's a photographer on the far right that appears to be a woman. And I suppose the sort of follow on question from there is, were, was the, the company employing female photographers at all during its history? Um, I, well, we have some details of the photographers that, that they employed. Um, but I'm not aware that they had any women. They certainly employed women, uh, um, you know, in the in the kind of stereotypical roles. I think they they had um, secretaries, but I don't um, 
I don't believe that they had any women photographers, but I couldn't say that for sit. Um, and Steve Judson's asking when the collection was acquired, were there any cameras amongst the boxes of plates and negatives? Sadly not, not that I'm aware. Um, basically what we got were the photographs um, and the documentation and some associated documentation, uh, some prints and some ephemera, which we have found um, within, the, um, within, the, within the collection. Um, but um, not, um, not cameras. I have done a couple of uh, oral histories, um, one with a uh, bail photographer, and I also did one with John Mills um, in about 2008 to, uh, to get an idea of what another photographic firm, um, you know, their awareness of, of bail at the time, um, which was quite interesting. So we've kind of um, we've expanded on some of the material that we have, and also through um, uh, through you know through gifts and purchases. But unfortunately, um, no cameras. Um, and we have a question from Bill Brown, which is rather nice. Which is asking, uh, he's asking whether you have a favourite image amongst the whole collection. Um, yeah, that's very difficult. Um, and I mean, I've I've seen a. I've seen quite a number of images in the collection, but it's it's actually quite small when you think of the quantity of it. Um, I do like that. Um, I do like that tunnel image, uh, and I like some of the um, I like some of the uh, industrial images as as well, and and the panoramas. I'm not sure I have I have one favourite. I think I have favourites kind of in, in different areas really. So. Mm. Um, and we've got lots of nice comments and best wishes for your retirement and also um, comments expressing uh, um, interest and the, the recognition of the value of the, the collection. And I'll share the, the chat with you separately. Um, I'm going to hand over to Gilly now, just whether you've got any last comments, Gilly, because we're, we're slightly over time, but I think everyone's staying with us for the moment. Yeah, no, oh, no, that was wonderful talk. It was very interesting because I work with a photographer actually from Liverpool and I I find industrial photography fascinating indeed yeah uh, and also I like architectural photography very much I did like the big camera it looked very crude actually very uh, basic very very basic yes yeah, but he obviously had um movable backs so that yes they had the been perpendiculars were very perpendicular they were very carefully done yes uh, yeah very much yes Yes, I enjoy that. Anyway, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Well, thank you. <laughs> very enjoyable too. Yeah. And again, on behalf of the, the RPS's historical group, again, Anne, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and opening our eyes to, to what's in the collection. I hadn't been aware of the, the richness of the collection, so it's been a, a real pleasure to see that. And mm -hmm. I'd echo some of the comments that we have in the chat here and, and just like to say best wishes for your own retirement and for yes. whatever you decide you're going to do in, in the future. We appreciate you spending the time in, in your last week or so with us. And thank you again. And thank Thank you to our audience for your time this evening and we hope, hope you enjoyed the, the presentation from Anne and we look forward to seeing you on the next collection talk hopefully in the next month or so. So thank you everyone. Thank you Anne and thanks Gilly for hosting the evening. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.